on TV with Jerry Garcia. And, you know, we remember funny things. Uh, and he was talking about Woodstock. And he said, we had the unfortunate placement of being in between The Who and Jimi Hendrix. So The Who came out and they smashed all their stuff. And then everybody cheered, everybody went wild. And then we came out and played our songs, ding, ding, ding. And then Jimi Hendrix came out and burned his guitar. And we were in the most unforgettable spot on the show. Well, we just watched some uh, great talks from Planet Labs people. And GDAL 2 is next. So I sort of feel like I'm in that position right now, in between uh, The Who and, and Jimi Hendrix. Anyway, my name is Matthew Hansen. Uh, I am from New Hampshire, the seacoast area. So America has 15,000 miles of seacoast. And when you say the seacoast, you'd think, oh, well, maybe, maybe California is the seacoast, or maybe Florida is the seacoast, right? Or my home state of Maine, which has 3,500 miles of seacoast. But no, if you type in the seacoast into Google, you're going to get New Hampshire with its 18 miles of seacoast. <laughs> so anyway, so a little bit about me other than the seacoast thing. My background is in imaging science. I've been doing that for 20 years for a variety of applications. Uh, most recently, the last few years, is environmental uh, applications, deforestation monitoring, time series, agriculture, and that sort of stuff. Uh, I went to RIT, where I got a degree actually in imaging science. It wasn't actually a, a, a science degree, well, a science degree, but it wasn't. A lot of people learn about imaging science as a tool for their own, for their own research, and uh, I actually studied it sort of on its own, as its own discipline. <clears throat> So the best solutions to things are those that have a clearly defined problem. My youngest daughter, Maisie, has participated the last few years in this thing called the Young Inventors Club at school. She's 11 years old. And they tell you that you got to first come up with a problem that you got to solve. You have an, you know, the, the invention has got to solve a problem. So last year it was... Uh, women generally don't have pockets, but they all have phones, and so she came up with the boot pocket. All right, so you get so you can put your phone in your pocket. And this year it was the high heel switcheroo, uh, so you can switch. You have a swappable heel, so you can swap between a flat and a medium heel and a high heel. It's all very exciting, isn't it? Well, the truth is is that in the description uh, it probably didn't say anything about hippie festivals or women's fashion or fun facts about the seacoast, so I'll get right into the actual meat of it. The problem in remote sensing science, um, the last few years we've actually seen a lot more raster processing here at FOS4G. Uh, my first FOS4G was in Denver, and there really was very little. Everything was focused on vector stuff. Um, but now with the advent of these Earth imaging companies like Planet, uh, and the desire for the ultimate, most recent base map. Uh, we've seen you know, half the talks seem like they're about raster. And there's a lot of great existing tools out there for individual raster processing and algorithms and implementations of these, of, of various algorithms for, for, for development. Um, and for distributed raster processing. But these tools generally assume that you already have the data. So now in science applications, it's a little bit of a different use case than the latest and greatest base map. You need access and to analyze many years of data. And you need to fuse disparate types of data. And so when we have a new project, uh, an area of study, what we generally start with is this. Right, we have nothing. So how do you get from the, oh, well, there's the red dot. <laughs> That's actually, we, you don't start with the red dot, but the nothing, the rest of it. 
So how do you go from nothing to actually all this data that you need to analyze for your region of interest? Well, you know what? If there was a universal standard, it would be easy, right? Just one universal standard. You know where I'm going with this, right? I'll just give you a second. Yeah, so that doesn't really doesn't work. Data standards for science uh, is sort of an exercise in futility. I mean, f standards are good going forward, and if you want the, the latest data and the most recent data, and, and we need standards, of course. But for scientific applications, you're always going to need to access and analyze data that was generated with a variety of different standards, most, most specifically because you're looking at a lot of historical data. And so there's variations in this. And now the file format issue is handled very nicely by GDAL, but you have different file naming conventions. There's different tiling systems. Landsat has this path row. Modis has their tile system. The band ordering and names are completely different. You, everybody's got to look it up uh, you know, every time. Well, what, what's the red band? Is it band five? Is it band six? Uh, and this takes up a lot of time. And of course, the no data values, sometimes they're embedded in the image, sometimes they're not, sometimes they're in ancillary files. So when you start a new project as an analyst, you first got to identify all the data that's available for your study region. What data sources are available, how they're distributed, how they're accessed. If they're tiled, what tiles do you need? You need to go and identify which tiles cover that area. Uh, and all the important metadata if it's somewhere else, and you got to combine all that, you got to download all the data. This is the most often thing that people will script and automate. And then you got to pre process that data, and for some it's easier. Modus is fairly easy because it comes in a wide variety of products already. Landsat, not as easy because it, it doesn't. Uh, and then managing all of these tiles and products and data sources. Uh, results in a working directory that looks a lot like this. So now in New Hampshire, we have something called Antique Alley, Route 4, cuts across the state. I call them junk shops, and that's what they look like. So at work, whenever I look in somebody else's directory of stuff that they've been working on, I'm like, I hope you don't get hit by a bus because nobody is going to make any sense out of what you've been working on. There's, there's no consistent naming convention. No one knows what any of this is except for the person that did it. And so they spend all this time doing all of this. And now, OK, I've got all my data. I've got my, my junk shop, my working directory. And now it's time for analysis. And so. I'm out of money, or very close. We spent a lot of time at the company I'm at now actually just doing all of this pre-processing stuff to get to the point where we can actually do the analysis. So I'm actually mostly out of jokes at this point. So it's smooth sailing from now on. So seriously, this inordinate amount of time is a, is a real problem. And especially if you now want to move it on to the next step. You might have done your initial analysis. It might have been a pilot study comparing to ground truth. And you did it on a few scenes or a few plots. Uh, but now, what if you want to scale that up to, uh, to, to lots, of, lots of plots, lots of historical data? You want to go back 20 years. And this is a largely manual process, and that is the problem. So now I've sort of clearly stated the problem. The description uh, for this talk was scaling up image processing, and it's, it was probably a bad way to put it because I'm not talking about the same type of scaling up that like Planet is doing with all that data. I'm talking about how scientists can actually access a large amount of data for a specific region of interest for for what, what they're interested in, for, for, their, for their area of study. So enter GIPS. GIPS is sort of the next part of abstraction. So I wanted to abstract away the tiles and the peculiarities of these data sets. All, the manual process 
uh, the, all the analysts will generally tend to use the GDAL command line utilities to, to do all those things. I wanted more command line utilities to sort of take that to the next level. I want to just write, hey, give me all the Landsat data for this region, uh, download it, process it into NDVI, atmospherically correct it, and dump it into this directory so I have my nicely time-ordered series of Indiana NDVI for 2007 to 2010. So data sources in GIPS are described by developing a driver, so, except GIPS is completely written in Python. And this provides the functionality, so it's, I wanted to keep it in Python because it was easily accessible to end users. They could easily add a driver. Uh, and, it, and, not in a, and it could be a unique. Scientists generally deal a lot with very unique data sets that really maybe not a whole lot of other people are interested in. So that was pretty important, is to integrate all this. Right now, uh, GIPS has, provides drivers for uh, Landsat 5, 7, and 8, and MODIS, and some radar data. And we also use a lot of climate data. So we've been using MARA and DAMET, uh, if you're familiar with those, and also the crop data layer for agricultural purposes. GIPS works on the concept of having a spatial uh, site with this is a database, this is a geometry in a database or a shape file, and you can easily um, uh, loop through multiple geometries so that you could, if you had a shape file, let's say, of a thousand farm fields and you wanted the NDVI of that, you could just, hey, give me an NDVI for this, you know, all of these farm fields entirely. And that shape file, that geometry, the projection, that's your, that's your projection of interest. Most often it's in some sort of equal area for these purposes, but whatever it may be. But you know, you go into the project, okay, I have, you, you, you're defining your parameters, you're defining your project. You, okay, I've got Indiana, I'm using this projection, I, I, I want things in this resolution. That's something that you sort of set up beforehand, and that defines the, the extent. And you do the same thing with the temporal extent. Now, I'm gonna sidetrack here for just a second and talk about Gippy. So, the title of it was Gips and Gippy, but really Gips is the Python library that does all of this abstraction and processing of the remote sensing data. Um, Gippy is, this story will sound familiar to anybody who saw Camilla and Charlie's uh, talk the other day, but uh, Gips is in Python and it's well suited for, for all sorts of things, including uh, argument parsing and string manipulation, all that stuff that's really annoying to do in C. Uh, however, the GDAL Python bindings are, are difficult to use. <laughs> and so I developed a library to, to replace that. And I wanted to combine it with uh, image processing so that I would have a library that could integrate GDAL, read any geospatial format, chain together operations, multiple operations, and then automatically chunk up that raster data, process it, write it out to a file, all sort of seamlessly. Uh, and so Gippy is, is what resulted. It's a C++ library with uh, manually created SWIG interface files that you uh, try and be very careful about uh, to, to make a, a sensible Python interface to it. And there's a variety of convenience functions. It's primarily used by Gips right now. Uh, I, I did consider maybe uh, incorporating Rasterio instead, but I, I think at this point still, Gippy provides some, some interesting functionality in terms of image processing and the chunking of large raster data. And it also has some common algorithms included in it, such as ACCA, which is the cloud masking algorithm that is used in Landsat, uh, as well as some, some others. Uh, so libgip is that C++ library. Uh, the challenges are large data, the handling of missing data, and all, all the things that we're probably all, all familiar with. Like I said, it integrates GDAL, um, and then the other thing that it incorporates is CImage, which is an image processing template library. 
And that's what actually does all the processing behind the scenes. So here's some examples in Gippy. It's, it's strictly a, a, a library. And you can see it's similar to the ease in which Rasterio can be used. So you can just read it in an image. And if the metadata is, is if you actually have your band description set, you can just say, you know, read the red band and threshold it or, or add a number or divide it or whatever. You'll see uh, the example there converting radiance to top of the atmosphere reflectance is an example of how the Landsat data is processed. It chains together those operations. And then at the end, it will actually uh, piece that up depending on parameters that you set for memory usage. And uh, it'll chunk it up into pieces, process it, and, and write it out at the end. So back to GIPS, though. So that's, that's really kind of a library that's used by GIPS. Uh, I, I did want to focus more on, I didn't really want to get into the sort of the code. I really wanted, my goal here was so that people could actually get going using this. So I'm not going to talk about drivers or the code underneath anymore. Uh, I, I just wanted to talk about the use of the command line utilities and the installation. So I, installation, it's Ubuntu right now. I, I, I don't actually think that it would work very well on Windows. I haven't tested it on Windows. There's some things with linking that it does, and I, I, I'd like to change that, of course, now that this is open source and now that people might actually look at it. I think it's important. I've got to take the next step and make sure that it's it works on, on multiple platforms. So Gippy first uh, needs to be installed. And I, I, it is on PIP, but there's currently a problem uh, that I haven't fixed yet because I was busy doing slides instead. So uh, you have to kind of clone it from the repository right now. I, I quickly changed the installation here this morning. Uh, but Gips is in uh, PyPy. And if you want atmospheric models, you have to install those. So 6S is easy enough to install, although th there's some notes on the GitHub repo for GIPS uh, about that, because it, it doesn't actually install as is if you follow their instructions on Ubuntu. There's some issues with the Fortran compiler that I used. And Modtran. And if you want to install Modtran, you're sort of on your own with that. It, uh, it's not actually readily downloadable by everybody. You'll have to get special permission or whatever, however people get that. Once you install it, there's a settings file. And this describes the repositories of where your stuff is located. You can set a database in there if you want to connect to. The database, again, is strictly used for regions of interest. So if you have uh, all your fields or plots in a database, you can connect to that. So this is where you'd put that. And then you can just specify that on the command line. Uh, and the repositories simply give locations of where these things are located locally. So once you update that, all the command lines will work. If you, of course, do tab completion, gips underscore tab tab, you'll see all of the command lines that are there. They all use the same naming convention. It's all gips underscore something with no dot pi on the end. So GIPS info is the, is the main, uh, is, will give you information on what data sources are available and also what products are available for those data sources. So if you just type in GIPS info, as you can see, it'll show you the data sources available. And if you give it a data source, if you say GIPS info Landsat, for instance, it'll print out all the products that are available for Landsat. GIPS inventory checks what currently is in the inventory. And I didn't put it on here, but there's a, there's a bunch of keywords. And one of them is fetch. So you can give it a, you say GIPS inventory, you give it a site, you give it a time series, and fetch. And it'll go and download the available data for that. Uh, and it reports, uh, I don't know if, you, if that's big enough. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. So given your spatial region of interest, this will show you the percent overlap of all the tiles, how much of the tile is used, and then the actual coverage for your site. So you can easily see for any day, all right, you know, I got 79% coverage this day, I got 5% the next day, 
and it's, it's useful for when you're doing these sorts of time series. Uh, and the list of products that it shows there, that simply is showing you the products that have actually been processed on the back end. Uh, GIPS archive is used to actually copy assets into the repository if you're not automatically fetching them. That's actually currently how we're using Landsat because of the way that the Landsat works is you have to, for Landsat 5 and 7 uh, at least, is that you have to make an order first and request the processing before it becomes available. And so we've just been using Earth Explorer. We just have, you know, we hire an army of, of interns and we say, hey, download all this stuff and uh, you know, we'll buy you lunch. <laughs> so that copies the assets into the repository and if al also some stuff isn't available to automatically download. You, you might implement a driver for something and you can't get it as, as easily and so you just, however you would normally get that data and then this inspects the file, checks it for problems and puts it away into the repository um, for later use. GIPS process and GIPS project, these are really the main things that, that people would be using. Uh, it's important to note that these also take all the inventory arguments, including fetch, so you could actually bypass a lot of that and you could just say GIPS project, and this creates a project directory for your spatial and temporal region, given all the products. GIPS process just processes the backend tiles, so the way that it works is you get the original tiles, the, the ass, these are called, uh, we call these assets, and they're, they're processed into product tiles that are stored along with that. And then project is actually what takes then all those and then cuts them out and combines them together and creates a project directory. And so here you have a nicely ordered time sequence of products for your region of interest ready to use, ready for analysis, and that's where now you can have substantially more money in your, in your contract to actually look at this stuff rather than spending time actually getting to this point. There's also some project utilities, which I sort of ran out of time to, to, to talk about that, it, or ran out of time making my slides. Uh, GIPS mask, the, these, are, these are things that operate on these project directories. GIPS mask will automatically take masks and apply them to the products. And there's statistics like a zonal summary. Uh, and not available w within GIPS right now uh, is I've done a lot of temporal classification uh, algorithms and utilities for, for doing, um, for, for analyzing these time series for uh, identification. Specifically, we've been doing a lot of agricultural rice mapping and uh, water quality. Uh, I have a few notes here on the specific data sources. So the Landsat driver supports Landsats 5, 7, and 8. Uh, it, there's a variety of products that are available, a, a variety of indices. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I don't have the list here, the complete list, but there's NDVI, LSWI, SATV, MSAVI2, as well as reflectance, uh, radiance, top of the atmosphere versions of all of those. The atmospheric correction is done using 6S for the visible and midwave and modtran for the long wave. And it works a little bit differently than LEADAPS. LEADAPS uses in-scene methods to do the atmospheric correction. Uh, I use uh, Mod 08 is an atmosphere product of aerosols, so we use that and MARA to characterize the atmosphere, which works fine for historical data when, that's, when the aerosols and the MARA atmospheric profiles are available, but if you want to do anything more recent, like within 60 days, um, that's generally why people move towards uh, in, in scene methods to, to do that, is, for, is to get real time. And there's cloud masks, uh, both ACCA and FMASK, uh, two, two different algorithms, neither one of which really work all that well. Of course, that's the nature of cloud masking. Uh, I, I do hope to sort of improve upon those given time in the future. 
Uh, oh, and then temperature. There is a, uh, I said that it's, Modtran is used for um, correcting the long wave. It's, that's actually not entirely true. There's a water temperature product because in order to correct for the long wave, you need an emissivity. And so we sort of assume a standard emissivity for water, but for land, you, you can't as easily correct for that. Uh, so one of the things I hope to do in the future is to incorporate the MODIS uh, emissivity product in order to try and correct that for land as well, in order to get land temperature. The MODIS only has several products now, and we sort of just add them as needed, uh, but now that now that I'm giving this talk and maybe people will look at it, then uh, I, I, I'm going to expand this out in order to give access to a, a, a lot of the MODIS products. The MODIS is sort of already distributed as products, but their GIPS really provides a way to incorporate those and, again, abstract away of all the tiles, but also combine the Aqua and Terra platforms so that you can actually get temperature from you know, both times a day or NDVI from both sensors for a more, more complete product. There's other data sources as well, uh, but I didn't really want to focus on those. Uh, those actually need, require more, more testing. Um, in the next few weeks, I'll be, I'll be doing that. There's a variety of things that can be done. So I want complete functionality for all the existing data sources and automatically downloading of, of all the ones that are available. And more data sources. Uh, I also had some other ideas for image registration. Oftentimes, in order to combine multiple sensor modalities, you'll have misregistration between them. So given a, a couple project directories, it'd be nice to, to automate that process so that you have at least relative reg registration between, between them so that you can do pixel comparisons uh, between, di between different sensors and data sources. Um, and then, who knows what else? You know, hopefully, I'll get some feedback um, from users and and really expand this out to be a, a useful tool, useful for the remote sensing science community. Thank you. Is there any questions, Frank? Okay, so is yeah, so this is so everything is local. Um, there is, although some data we, it, it's all it's all local. One of the things I would like to do is actually incorporate cloud-based because there's really necessary. There's not necessarily any reason to keep it all completely local, uh, as as you had pointed out. There's a lot of this data is available in the cloud. It's publicly available, and especially now given you know, ways to access certain regions, it would be nice to move it to the next step where you're actually only storing now in your, a repository doesn't necessarily have to be local. It's, it's local right now, but it, it, there's nothing necessarily in the system that means that it has to be local. It's how you actually process it. So, for instance, Mara, we actually get that from an open DAP server, and we just cut out the region that we need. So I'd like to actually have the data sources work more like that in the future. And then you're only storing on your system, you're storing your Indiana, let's say. Any other questions? All right, Frank. <laughs> um, uh, so this, was a, this is really well adapted, I think, to the science product. Um, do you see um, moving to more um, doing work with just like the standard Google products, like where it might support mosaic and things like that just from uh, commercial visible products as opposed to more science oriented it, it could. I, I mean, I, I, had, I had thought about how to, uh, yeah, I had actually thought about you know, how would you s automate this to say, give me a mosaic for January 
of 2010 and have it go and aut automatically look at all of the sensor that you have in your inventory, all the data sources you have in your inventory, and, and try and automatically make a mosaic. So, of course, I'm all about incorporating other tools, and so, you know, PL Compositor, maybe that is something that could be, in, you know, in, incorporated. I haven't looked at the code, but, you know, at, behind the scenes sort of thing. Anything else? Thank you again. <laughs>